Hi everyone, welcome back to another lecture. This is Amir Ahmed, Faculty of Zoology at Extra Marks. So in today's class, we are going to continue our discussion with the chapter of evolution. So the topic today is going to be the evidences of evolution and this topic will be dealt in two parts and today will be the first part of it. All right. So let us see the overview of the topics which we are going to discuss today. First, we'll talk about the paleontological evidences which are going to prove evolution has occurred. Then we'll derive our evidences from morphology and anatomy of the organisms. Then evidences from vestigial organs, connecting links and a process called as atavism. Now, what are these conditions? we'll be discussing in the coming period okay now first of all the first evidences of evolution are paleontological evidences now in case of paleontology you have to understand paleontology is nothing but the study of fossils now what are fossils fossils basically you know are the impressions of the remains of the organisms the soft part of these organisms will be decomposed and the hard parts will be retained so that are called as fossils Clear about this. Now, the father of paleontology is generally the Leonardo da Vinci. So, da Vinci is father of paleontology. Okay. Now, also you can say George Cuvier is the father of modern paleontology. So, George's Cuvier is the father of modern paleontology. Now, also you have to understand these paleontological evidences are the direct evidences for evolution. Okay, so they are what? Direct evidences. Now, what do you mean by direct evidences? Literally, they are there in front of our eyes. For example, let's say human evolution. We couldn't have ever imagined that these organisms, I mean, the our ancestors and us are related because we look so different. Then how are we able to link them with us? So that is because of the fossils. We found their fossils and presume that they are our ancestors. Okay. Now, basically, the fossils are the remains of the hard parts which are preserved of the organisms. Now, how can you derive that paleontological evidence or the direct evidence that we will see? First of all, understand the stratification of earth. You know that when you talk about earth, there are different strata of earth. And you know that older strata was formed primitively and then these newer or the younger strata. So this is the new strata and this is the oldest strata, isn't it? So as you can see, first topic under paleontological evidences is number and nature of fossils in the early rocks. So when you talk about the earliest rocks, you can see few fossils. When you come to the recent rocks, you can see lot of fossils. That means the number of individuals have increased when compared to the older days. And when you compare to these, they will be primitive organisms and these guys will be the complex organisms. So the complexity is increasing, isn't it? From the simple organisms, complexity is eventually increasing from the new to the old to the newer strata of the earth. So does that prove that what do you mean by evolution? Isn't the evolution is nothing but change. Isn't these simpler organisms, you know, evolving or becoming complex day by day? So that it is happening in the number and the nature of the fossils in the early rocks. Next, the distribution of fossils in the successive strata. The earth's crust, as we discussed, are made up of these sediments or different layers. The deeper layers, the oldest layers and the upper layers are formed later. This means that fossil formed in the deepest layer died earlier, which were of simpler type, the same thing which we discussed earlier. And the recent strata, they are the complex type. Basically, fossil records are nothing but, you know, they refer to the history of the fossils. The rocks of Paleozoic era consisted or contains the fossils of invertebrates, fishes and amphibians. Whereas the rocks of Mesozoic era has more of reptilian fossils. How that happens? Once we understand a topic called as geological timescale, they will be able to make out that these things, you know, the older ones formed in the earlier eras and the newer ones formed in the recent eras. Now, disparity between the past and present forms. Now, what do you mean by disparity? Disparity means nothing but change. When you compare older human fossils and modern humans, you can clearly see that, see that there is change or disparity or there is difference between the older and the newer organisms. 
Aren't we more well developed when compared to the older fossils? Isn't it? Isn't it a direct evidence that humans have evolved indeed? So this disparity between the past and the present forms also prove that evolution has occurred. Next, missing links, or they are also called as a transitional forms. Now, what are these missing links? These are nothing but fossil connecting links. These are the connecting links which are missing, basically missing. That means which don't exist anymore, which have, you know. So, in this case, fossil connecting links are nothing but missing links. For example, Archaeopteryx, which is an extinct bird. So, the fossil was discovered by Andreas Wagner from Bavaria, Germany. It was found in the rocks of which period? Jurassic period. Now, why do we call organisms as connecting links? Any organism which has the characteristic between two groups of organisms will be called as a connecting link. For example, euglena can be called as a connecting link between plants and animals because it has both the characters of plants as well as animals. Now, if let's say euglena went extinct, then what will you call them as? We'll call them as missing links. If we never found Archaeopteryx, would we have been able to connect the relationship between reptiles and birds? No. Isn't it? So, what were the characters which Archaeopteryx had which made it a connecting link? It had reptilian uh, characters like long tail, there were no pneumatic bones, and the sternum was weak, unlike the birds. Caudal vertebrae was free, unlike the birds. Birds had fused caudal vertebrae. Similar type of teeth in jaws, but birds do not have any jaws. Presence of feathers were the avian characters of Archaeopteryx. Two jaws were modified to form beak. Four limbs were modified to form wings. Hind limbs were very similar to that of the birds that are covered by the scales. So these organism or this animal that is Archaeopteryx had both reptilian as well as avian characters. So that we could consider this as a connecting link, isn't it? Now it has gone extinct. If we were never able to find the fossil of Archaeopteryx, we would not be able to connect this with reptiles as well as apes. We could have never clearly said that apes evolved from reptiles. That is why we call birds as glorified reptiles. Huxley called them this. Birds are glorified reptiles. Right? So this is Archaeopteryx. This is the exact way the Archaeopteryx was found. This is just a diagram of it. Other examples of missing links. Ethiosega. It is a fossil amphibian. It is a missing link between fishes and amphibians. Samoria. It is, a, um, it is a connecting link between amphibians and reptiles. Lysinops is a mammal-like reptile, missing link between reptiles and mammals. Basilosaurus is a fossil whale, which is a missing link between aquatic and terrestrial mammals. So these are the missing links, which are basically found through the fossils. Next, different types of fossils. First one are called as unaltered fossils. Basically what happens, these fossils will be unaltered because their original soft parts will be fossilized. For example, for the woolly mammoth in Siberia was frozen in ice, right? So it is 25 years old and it is said that the meat of this woolly mammoth is still very fresh till date. Why? It was preserved as such. Similarly, few insects can get trapped in amber which is nothing but the resin of conifers. Those also will not undergo any sort of change because they don't interact with the external environment. They are preserved as such. So that is why they are called as unaltered fossil. Example, you can take that of 25,000 year old woolly mammoth in Siberia and even insects trapped in the amber. Second one are called as the petrified fossils, also called as altered fossil. Here, the living organisms are basically made up of organic substances. These organic parts or the soft parts will be replaced molecule by molecule by mineral deposits. Now, what will be those mineral deposits? Iron pyrite, silica and calcium carbonate. Basically, they are 50 crore year old fossils. Okay. Next, molds or casts. Now, the materials around the organism, let's say this was an organism and the organism is dead now. If there is no flowing water, there is no lot of wind, then in this case what happens? Here, the sand will be deposited onto the, the sand layers will be deposited on the organism. So, layer by layer it will be deposited and the interaction between the environment will not be there. 
So here this dead organism is trapped between these inorganic molecules. Now what happens molecule by molecule the organic molecules will be replaced the inorganic molecules like iron pyrites and silica. Okay. Now if this organism will become petrified if the organism becomes petrified that means organic molecules are replaced by inorganic ones together with the petrified fossil and the cover or the material which has taken its shape together it can be called as a cast it can be called as a cast if the organism is decomposed only the impression is maintained then that will be called as the mold it will be called as mold so if the organism will harden and what is left is just a mold then it will be called as a mold if the petrified fossil is there in it it will be called as a cast okay now few uh, prints can also be considered as fossils like footprints of footprints of organisms or prints of leaf stem skin wing etc compressions they are nothing but plant fossils where the internal structure will be completely decomposed and only a thin carbon film which is giving the outline of the plant will be existing so such fossils are called as compressions coprolites are nothing but fossilized excreta of the organism this is a very important point so coprolites are nothing but excreta preserved excreta of the animals microfossils and palynofossils are nothing but fossils of spores pollen grains and other microscopic structures and this can be associated with oil wherever you find a lot of microfossils or palynofossils there you have a lot of chance of finding oil okay next time dating of fossils how can you calculate the age of the fossil and determine when this organism was existing so this is called as the clock of the rock first one is relative dating no relative dating is not an accurate method but by the by finding which strata it is existing in you can basically predict in which era it was existing so that is relative dating but absolute dating also called as a radioactive dating acts on the characteristic of half life of radioactive elements so what is important here understanding the half life now what are radioactive elements which basically produce light isn't it while doing such they are undergoing something called as decay radioactive decay okay for example uranium will convert into lead isn't it so let's say 1 gram of uranium 238 is converting into lead 206 so here 1 million grams of uranium will convert into 17600 grams of lead okay so now if you calculate the amount of lead which is present in the rock you can easily calculate the age of the rock isn't it same we can talk about the carbon carbon you know unstable carbon uh, unstable carbon 14 is converting into stable n14 so in this case if you calculate the amount of nitrogen which is present in that rock then also you can calculate the uh, age of that rock thus when the age of the rock is calculated the age of the fossil is also determined same way potassium is converted into argon so here the radioactive decay is used to calculate the age of the rock hence the age of the fossils can also be calculated clear about this the last one and the most accurate method of radioactive uh, dating method or the dating method of fossils is called as electron spin resonance method also called as esr method you don't need the details of how it is performed just remember esr method is the most accurate method of calculating the date or the age of the fossils next few fossil parks in india basically fossil parks are these uh, conserved areas where lot of fossils have been found in india there are five bir uh, four birbal sahani institute of paleo botany in lucknow 50 million year old fossils in mandla district madhya pradesh 100 million year old foss uh, fossil forest in rajmahal hills bihar 260 million year old coal forming forests in odisha so these are the main uh, fossil parks which are found in india next concept is called as the pedigree of the horse also can be referred to as the evolution of horse it can also be referred to as the evolution of horse 
it was described by c marsh the primitive fossil horse was found in north america now what is the generalized evolutionary trend which the horses show first one general increase in body size length of the neck and limbs have increased so size length of the neck and limbs have increased enlargement of brain and even the cranial capacity has increased progressive loss of toes here what happens let's say if the primitive horse had five limbs if the primitive horse had five limbs the horses in the later days these limbs would develop these structures which are present at the joints which are called as splint bones so these bones will be called as splint bones right and what has happened now there is only one toe which exists in the horse okay so this progressive loss of toes can be seen in this case increase in the complexity of molars and also premolars until they resemble the molars so basically what happens the complexity of molars increased and the premolars developed so much they end they ended up looking like premolar so this is the evolutionary trend of the horse let us see in detail what is happening and what are the different kinds of horse fossils which have been found so the first and the oldest horse uh, fossil of the horse is called as eohippus the common name is called as hyracotherium also called as dawn horse also called as dawn horse the epoch which it was found in was eocene epoch now don't get confused about the epochs eras and the periods this will be clear in the geological time scale the size of the dog was 40 cm about the about a fox or a terrier dog four limbs had four complete fingers that is 2 3 4 and 5 and first finger formed the splint hind limbs had three toes that is 2 3 and 4 fifth toe formed the splint first toe was absent here teeth was completely covered by cementum there were no serrations on the molar teeth they were flat graze soft vegetation when you come to the second fossil of horse mesohippus this is called as intermediate horse found in oligocene epoch size was around 60 cm around a modern sheep three fingers were there one splint of the fifth fifth finger three toes middle one was longer so here you can see that there were three toes and middle one was longer like this molar teeth had some serrations merichippus that is the third fossil here and it is in series oldest one is eohippus next mesohippus next merichippus also called as ruminating horse found during miocene epoch 100 cm same three fingers middle one was long there was no splint so in merichippus there was no splint bone this is a very important point three toes middle one was longer well developed serration on the molar teeth for the first time merichippus developed very well developed serrations next pleohippus also called as pleocene horse found in pleocene epoch 120 cm in length one complete finger and two splints hind hind limbs also had only one complete toe and two splints this is the first one toed horse pleohippus was the first one toed horse molar teeth were long and very well developed cementum and serrations were there adapted for eating grass grazing the grass and the modern horse which is called as equus equus so here modern horse pleocene epoch 150 cm complete finger two splints one toe two splints in the hind limb the crowns of the molar teeth are elongated with enamel with suitable ridge this is suitable for grinding okay so this is the diagram of those horse this is eohippus Uh, in between there was miliohippus then merichippus pleohippus and equus now next concept is called as geological time scale so basically like we divide time in different phases like we divide into years months days hours seconds like that time or the larger time larger period times with regard to evolutionary history was divided into eons were the largest you can ignore eons after that eras eras were again divided into periods periods were again divided into epochs so which is the highest unit of time in geological time scale it will be 
era for our reference okay then period and then epochs so here you can see the following eras are there as zoic era is called as era of no life a means absence zoa means life so no life archaeozoic was the era of primitive life era of primitive life so azoic archaeozoic so in this case azoic era era of no life archaeozoic era era of primitive life <coughs> excuse me so the next four eras here are proterozoic era also called as pre cambrian paleozoic era mesozoic era and cenozoic era so mnemonic to remember the eras yes please pay my cash so in this case you would have to remember what is representing what p proterozoic era another p paleozoic era m mesozoic era c the recent cenozoic era the oldest one was azoic archaeozoic then proterozoic paleozoic mesozoic and cenozoic era next as you can see here this is the pre cambrian also called as the proterozoic era paleozoic era mesozoic era cenozoic era no proper activities occurred in azoic and archaeozoic which we would have to discuss here so we'll start from the proterozoic era also called as the pre cambrian era so in this case you can see arthropods soft bodied arthropods formed lugin arge was there unicellular bacteria atmosphere is rich in carbon dioxide oceans and continents formed here unicellular bacteria again blue green algae soft bodied arthropods so the evolutionary sequence is like this from bottom to upwards okay so this is about the proterozoic era also called as pre cambrian era next the paleozoic era as you can see here pre cambrian era will have will not have any period so no periods here whereas paleozoic era can be divided into 1 2 3 4 5 6 periods okay so here a mnemonic to remember the periods we'll see that so camels often sit down carefully perhaps we can continue with this their joints creak okay so the mnemonic to remember the periods of both paleozoic as well as mesozoic era so that is cambrian uh, sorry uh, that is camels which will refer to cambrian often ordovician sit silurian down devonian carefully carboniferous perhaps permian so till here you can remember that these all come under paleozoic era and the periods under mesozoic era so that will be triassic jurassic and cretaceous there triassic joints jurassic cretaceous creek okay so the sequence is again like this this will being the oldest this being the recent this being the oldest this being the new one okay so what are the what is the mnemonic to remember the periods of paleozoic and mesozoic era camels often sit down carefully perhaps their joints creak okay now as you can see the events here marine invertebrates formed there was no terrestrial right life at first fishes were formed first trace of life on land which was seen plants then amphibians evolved from the fishes the urge of evolving into a terrestrial habitat fishes evolved into amphibians vertebrates that is the coal beds were formed and then first reptiles were also formed crude terrestrial organisms reptile dominance replaces the amphibians okay so these things happened in the paleozoic era when you come to mesozoic era frogs and turtles age of dinosaurs jurassic period is called as age of dinosaurs and then extinction of dinosaurs occurred during the cretaceous period now cenozoic era will be divided into tertiary and quaternary period this you would have to remember on your own again tertiary and quaternary period will be divided into epochs epochs will only be present in quaternary and tertiary period okay so how will you remember the epochs we'll continue this mnemonic camels often sit down carefully perhaps their joints creak perhaps engine oil might permit proper 
प्रॉपर हैंडलिंग राइट सो हियर वील सी हाउ डज दीज रिप्रेजेंट द इपोक्स perhaps from where we are starting starting from here isn't it so first epoch is paleocene engine eocene oil oligocene epoch might miocene permit pliocene remember first will be pliocene then will be pleistocene but remember this is in tertiary period and the rest two will be in the quaternary period proper means pleistocene handling means recent holocene always remember it as recent holocene okay so this is the epochs which fall under tertiary as well as quaternary periods now what are the events here rats small mammals rabbits have developed then uh, apes flowering plants trees then early human ancestors developed in the pliocene epoch then homo sapiens in pleistocene modern man was found in the recent holocene so it was found in the recent holocene which epoch are we in we are in holocene epoch which period are we in quaternary period which era are we in cenozoic era so we are in the cenozoic era so this is about the geological time scale this is how the time is divided in regard to the evolution next second evidences and one of the most important evidences every year there will be one to two questions at least from this topic and this year also there will be questions from morphological and anatomical evidences first we are going to talk about the organ systems how does organ system prove that evolution has occurred for example you can talk about vertebrate hearts and brains vertebrate hearts and isn't it how did this evolve or how do you, how do you consider this as the evidence for example let's say in case of pisces what type of heart was there two chambered heart was there isn't it so there was two chambered heart when you come to amphibians what happened three when you come to reptiles what happened three and a half or you can say three because intervert uh, ventricular septum was forming when you come to this was in case of amphibians reptiles when you come to apes you can clearly see four chambered heart developed and even in case of mammals four chambered heart will develop and similarly with regard to brain you can see cerebrum cerebellum medulla oblongata optic lobes are the common structures but it's just their complexity is increasing so organ systems are also a direct evidence where they generally show the evolution has occurred and we can clearly study that even kidney you can take the earlier individuals had pronephric kidney then mesonephric and what do we have now metanephric kidneys okay next are homologous organs remember this we have already discussed this in the evolutionary part h d that means homologous organs show divergent evolution so here in this case these organisms will have same fundamental structure but different functions based on those functions these organs perform based on the structure these organs perform different functions they have same basic plan remember they have what same basic plan but adults differ to perform different functions for example let's take the example last year this question was also asked four limbs of man cheetah whale and bat so they are all mammalian four limbs right so in this case what happened man wanted to grasp so he developed hands cheetah wanted to run so he developed paws whale wanted to swim so they developed flippers bat dev uh, wanted to fly so they developed patagium okay now these things the four limbs are all same so for example humerus radius ulna phalanges metaphalange all these structures basic plan is same but they differ in function because of their different habitat or requirements such evolution is called as divergent evolution and the resultant organs will be called as homologous organs other examples mouth parts of insects all of them will have what maxillae mandibles uh hypopharynx all the structures would be same but the functions would be different for example few of them will be modified for biting and chewing sucking and lapping is isn't it piercing and sucking then lapping type of mouth parts 
siphoning type of mouth parts. So different kinds of mouth parts will be seen, but their basic plan would be similar. Vertebrate heart and brains. Again, we have discussed about this. Thorn of bougainvillea and tendril of cucurbita. Both of them are axillary buds, but in case of bougainvillea, the axillary bud would develop into thorn for protection. In case of cucurbita, the axillary bud will develop into a tendril for climbing. You can take the biochemical or molecular homology as well. For example, let's take the best example ATP. ATP performs the same function right from amoeba till humans. Isn't it? So every molecule performing similar function in those and us also shows that we have just become complex and we have become more and more efficient in using those molecules. Next, this is the diagram. Homologous organs, as you can see, man, cheetah, whale, bat, they're all mammals. So you can see basic plan is all same, same type of bones are present. It's just that based on their habitat or functions, they are all different in function. So vertebrate breaks and this is the thorn of bougainvillea and tendril of cucurbita. So these are important diagrams, both of this about bougainvillea and the four lips of the mammals. Next, analogous organs. With the analogous organs or this process is called as analogy, you remember AC. Analogous organs show what type of evolution? Convergent evolution. So these are different group of animals which occupy a similar habitat. That means they need similar structures for surviving in that habitat. So they develop common structures. These are the organs which have similar function but their different structural details and their origin also is different. This is called as what evolution? Convergent evolution. Resultant of it is what organs? Analogous organs. For example, let's take the wings of a butterfly and birds. So butterfly and bird, what is butterfly? It is an arthropod. Bird is ave. Both of them want to fly. So what they have developed? They have developed wings. Eye of octopus. Octopus is a mollusk and mammals are basically mammals. Both of their eyes perform what? They are photoreceptors help in image formation. Flippers of a penguin and a dolphins. So basically in this, the forearms are modified. The penguin in this case is a bird and dolphin is a mammal. Sweet potato and potato, both of them are uh, tubers. One is a root modification, another one is a stem modification. But what they are doing, they are modified for storage. Both of them perform a similar function. Sting of a bee and a scorpion can also be considered as the analogous organ. So what type of... Uh, Evolution they are showing, convergent evolution. This is a very important topic. Out of analogous and homologous organs, every year guaranteed there will be a question. Next, vestigial organs. Now, what are vestigial organs? They are nothing but remnants of organs which were once complete and functional in the ancestors, but not in us. In humans, if you see, there are around 90 vestigial organs. For example, nictitating membrane. Now it is just reduced to the pink part at the tip of the eye. So this is called as the lyca semilunaris. Auricular muscles, that is the muscles of the ear pinna. We don't have the ability to move it. Vermiform appendix. So here you can see from the cecum what is arising. Vermiform appendix. According to NCRT, it is vestigial. Even if you want marks, you have to mark it as vestigial. But recent studies have shown that it is a part of immune system. Caudal vertebrae, we don't need the coccygeal vertebrae, even then they are present. Third molars, wisdom teeth, we don't need them, they are present. Body hair, we don't need that, they are present. Nipples in male, we don't need them, but even then they are present. So all these things can be considered as the vestigial organs in case of humans. In animals, for example, you can take pelvic girdle in python, in Greenland whales. It is not required, there are no limbs, so they don't need girdle bones there. Wings in case of flightless bones, splint bones in feet of horse, they are all vestigial organs. In plants, taminodes and pistilodes can be considered as the uh, vestigial organs. Next, connecting links. Now, how does connecting link prove evolution? It is very similar to that of missing links, but they are already present. So, we can show that they show common characters. So, hence from these, the organisms would have evolved. So, euglena is the connecting link between animals and plants. Proterospongia is a hypothetical ancestor and it is a connecting link between protozoa and porifera. Neopilina galathea is a connecting link between annelida and mollusca because it has both the characters of annelida and mollusca. Peripatus is a connecting link between annelida and arthropoda. Lungfishes, three species of lungfishes that is Protopterus, 
lepidosiren and neocytodus one is found in africa one is found in uh, south america one is australia so these are differentiated by land and in between them water is there obviously they can't be evolving differently at different point of time we'll discuss that in biogeographical evidences so these are connecting link between fishes and amphibians chimera is the connecting link between cartilaginous and bony fishes platypus and echidna that is monotremes mammals they are the connecting link between reptiles and mammals so these connecting links also prove that the one group of organisms have evolved from the other one next atavism now atavism is a interesting feature where reappearance of certain ancestral characters which they had or which had either disappeared or or reduced so let's say reappearance of functionality in case of vestigial organs can be called as atavism for example power of moving pinna few people example me i can move my ear pinna see so likewise reappearance of the vestigial organ functionality of the vestigial organs can also be considered as a evidence so power of moving pinna can be considered as atavism development of canine teeth we don't need that we are not you know basically Uh, predators or flesh eaters rigorous flesh eaters so we don't need developed canine teeth so, but in some people development of canine teeth short tail in the babies very important example so this is the example of, of atavism and in few individuals additional mammae will be there in few humans additional mammae will be there which is also not important so here you can see that the petiole and this is a plant evolution so basically we don't discuss that so animal ev evidences or animal proofs of atavism are these okay so this completes today's discussion in today's class we have discussed about the paleontological evidences we have uh, discussed about the anatomical and morphological evidences we have discussed about vestigial organs connecting links and atavism okay in next class we'll just carry on from wherever we have left off thank you so much for listening to the lecture